very happy to turn the call over to Jean Crane, CEO of Bremer Bank, to introduce our first guest, Neil Kashkari, again, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. So Jean, I will now hand off to you. All right. Thanks so much, John. I'm really glad to be here with everyone today. And I, I truly am honored to introduce Neil Kashkari, president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. The Minneapolis Bank is one of the Federal Reserve System's 12 regional banks, and it serves a district that includes Montana, North and South Dakota, Minnesota, parts of Northern Wisconsin, and Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Neil has held a variety of roles in public service and finance, and uh, most notably, I think for this group, he was the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury during the 2008 financial crisis where he oversaw the TARP program that certainly we all know well. Following his tenure in Washington, uh, President Kashkari returned to California in 2009 and joined PIMCO as Managing Director and member of the Executive Office. He left that firm in 2013 to explore returning to public service and in 2014 ran for the governor of California on a platform that focused on economic opportunity. Neil was raised in Ohio and he earned his bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering at the University of Illinois and his MBA from Wharton. And I personally have the distinct pleasure to serve with Neil on the Federal Reserve Bank Minneapolis board, and I am truly looking forward to our conversation today. So welcome, Neil. Thank you, Jean. It is great to be with you. Thank you for having me, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I thought I would start just for a couple of minutes, kind of an overview of how I'm seeing the economy, and then I'll, uh, we can sit down together and have a nice discussion uh, on whatever's top of mind for you. Obviously, the U.S. economy is going through a reopening. You know, the COVID crisis hit. The economy was in a very strong position before COVID hit us. The unemployment rate was at a, around a 50-year low at around 3.5%. The economy is doing quite well. COVID hit us, it was an unprecedented shock, an unprecedented level of uncertainty in the economy. And the economy went through a rapid shutdown as individuals and public health officials tried to get control of the virus and protect all of us, enhance public safety. And now the economy is going through a reopening and that reopening is highly uncertain. I know if you read the newspaper, you see um, reports of high inflation almost every day, different sectors, whether it's Lumber prices were soaring, uh, auto prices are high, housing prices are high, and a lot of people are wondering, what does that mean? Are we in for a period of high inflation going forward? My judgment is I don't think so. I think what we're experiencing is a rapid shutdown and a rapid reopening in the economy, and that is causing bottlenecks in certain sectors of the economy, especially those that are most closely tied to the pandemic shutdown and reopening. You know, Most of the high inflation that we're seeing are in a few sectors related to autos, related to travel and transportation, such as hotel prices and rental cars and whatnot. And my expectation is as the economy returns back to something more like normal, most of these temporary surges and price increases will level off and then we'll get back to normal. Now, some of that may take time. You know, um, the semiconductor sector, as an example, it takes years to build a new semiconductor factory. Some of that's related to the pandemic, some of it's not, some of it's just change in demand and industry has to catch up. But I'm not seeing evidence yet of these high inflation readings translating into expectations for long-term high inflation. And a, an important driver of this, and an important driver of my analysis of this is the labor market. You know, We still have today seven to nine million Americans who are not working, who would likely have been working if the pandemic had never happened. Seven to nine million Americans represents a meaningful chunk of our economy's potential. And so the key question that I'm wrestling with is how quickly can we bring those seven to nine million Americans back to work? The faster we can bring them back to work, the faster we can make these turn these transitory inflation pressures into more normal, uh, lower levels of inflation that we've been used to. And it'll be better for our economy overall and economic growth. But that's a big uncertainty. And now you know, it's so frustrating for all of us that the Delta variant is surging the way that it is. I was cautiously optimistic a month ago that it seemed like we had the light at the end of the tunnel and we were getting through this pandemic and could return to normal. A big question people have is why are seven to nine million Americans still on the sidelines when so many business or businesses are saying they're struggling to find workers? 
we've been able to identify three reasons. There are probably more. One reason is people are nervous about the virus. And you know they've been hearing from health officials for the last 18 months, shelter in place, social distance, people are nervous. They're nervous about getting back on buses and trains to go back to work. So that's one factor. Number two, childcare issues. When schools were closed, that put a tremendous burden on families with young children. Many people struggled. How can they do their job and take care of their children? The hope is that schools will be reopened in the fall. That pressure will be alleviated. And then of course, we know that there have been generous unemployment benefits and it just anecdotally makes sense. If you know that these unemployment benefits are going to expire in a month, and it seems like there are a lot of jobs available, it makes common sense that some people will say, well, why don't I wait a month before I go back to work? I mean, that's kind of common sense. So I think on all three factors, I'm optimistic that we should have a very strong labor market in the fall. But the wrinkle, so to speak, now is Delta, that if the Delta variant continues to surge, I think that that can continue to make people concerned about re-entering the labor market, going back to normal in terms of interacting, especially in the service industries. Uh, so that's a potential concern. And then if Delta chills kids returning to schools, then that also could then uh, undo some of the benefits of uh, restoring childcare, so to speak, and getting everybody back in. So there's still a lot of uncertainty on the road ahead. One thing I feel confident in is that you know, after the Great Recession, it took 10 years to rebuild the labor market and to put everybody back to work. We cannot have another 10-year recovery. And the US Congress is to be applauded for how aggressive they have been in supporting businesses and supporting workers and families through this pandemic. Congress, I really think, learned the lesson from 08 and said, we're gonna err on doing too much rather than too little. And I give them a lot of credit for that judgment. And I think we at the Federal Reserve also learned lessons from 2008 and 2009. And I'm not criticizing what we did back then, but I think we have got more confidence in some of these new tools like quantitative easing. And we acted even more aggressively in this crisis to support the economy and the recovery. And so you know, we are committed to achieving our goals, which is maximum employment as well as stable prices. And we're gonna use all of our tools to do that. So we're at a point of economic recovery and economic reopening. We're still in a deep hole. Seven to nine million Americans is a lot, of Ameri a lot of Americans, a lot of our fellow countrymen and women. And there's still a lot of uncertainty, especially as it relates to the virus in terms of what the future looks like for the next six months or so. And so with that overview, Gene, why don't I pause there and turn it over to you and we can have a conversation. Yeah, no, thanks a lot, Neil. That's really great perspective to start with. And, and clearly you've addressed what's on everybody's mind right now is the Delta variant because you've got businesses and municipality states, uh, you've got some large banks within the last 24 hours that are have already announced their delayed approach to employees returning to the office after Labor Day. So it's it's this whole uncertainty about the economic recovery is is truly still taking place, right? And, and that's the continued impact of the pandemic. So knowing that, what when you think about the key structural drivers influencing the U.S. economy to drive that growth that we're hearing about, what, what are those in your mind? What are the key structural uh, op opportunities that uh, we should pay attention to? Well, one thing we're seeing right now, because the virus did not affect the economy evenly, it affected certain sectors rather than others. So we know it affected service sectors in person, whether it's barbershops and beauty salons or gyms or restaurants, those service sectors are the ones that are struggling the most to reopen because you still have to have that in-person contact. And if people are nervous about going back to the restaurant or workers are nervous about going back into that environment, that's why you're seeing those bottlenecks there. So what ended up happening in the last year is people couldn't buy services. So where they spent money is they tended to spend money on more goods. So the good sectors are just booming. And what's really interesting, if you look, GDP has basically fully recovered from where it should be before the pandemic. So if you just look at a line of GDP, you see a blip, but we're fully recovered. And yet seven to nine million Americans aren't working. If you just do the math on that, the same amount of output with far fewer workers, productivity looks like it has soared. And that's because if you think about it, a manufacturer a manufacturer can run its manufacturing line at an extra 10%, and it doesn't cost them 10% more to do that. Right? There are economies of scale. For the services sector, it's much less scalable. And so part of what you're seeing right now is 
huge pressure on the good side of the economy, struggling for capacity on the services side, and that rebalancing as people go back to work, that's just going to take time. And there are going to be kinks that need to be worked out. One more comment. The good sector in particular, it's a global supply chain. So as Delta is ricocheting around the world and a lot of global companies are sourcing parts from abroad, they're running into struggles and they're trying to restore their supply chains, but Delta can also put a kink in those works, so to speak as well. So, you know, a lot of people are debating what is the future of the economy look like? And I would tell you, nobody knows for certain. There are going to be lasting changes and maybe it's things like Zoom like we're doing right now. Maybe that's a lasting change. But there are just also a lot of kinks that need to be worked out as we get to whatever the new future is. So, Neil, let's talk about the labor piece here a little bit more. Um, you might have noticed or have seen that the conference board gauge of, of uh, current conditions rose to a all-time high, fresh pandemic high of 160.3. And, and the share of consumers who said jobs were plentiful increased to a 21-year high of just under 55%. And, uh, and then the percentage of people saying that jobs are hard to get plunged to 10.5%, suggesting really that the unemployment rate could drop significantly over the rest of the year. So a few questions here. You know, we, you, know you talked about labor and the shortage that we're all hearing about in certain sectors, um, potentially you know, creating some inflationary pressures. Do you think that's real? I'm, I'm really interested in knowing if you think workers also have an opportunity to leverage their availability as they re-enter the workforce. I do. I do think at this moment, the balance of power, so to speak, between business and labor has swung in labor's direction. And, you know, so if restaurant workers are able to negotiate higher wages, I know the restaurant owners aren't going to like to hear this, but, you know, good for them. They're long overdue for a raise. They've got tough jobs, often in tough working conditions, not for a lot of money. And so if the balance of power swings in their direction, that's great. Uh, I don't think it's going to be permanent. I do think as seven to nine million Americans come back to work, there's going to be more labor supply and that, that imbalances will balance out somewhat when that starts to happen. And so that's overall what I see taking place. Now, how long is it going to take? Is it going to take six months? Is it going to take two more years? I don't know. I don't think it's going to take 10 years, but I don't think it's overnight. And you're right. I mean, the, the data suggests there are a lot of jobs available. That suggests something is holding people back. Now, one of the other things I'll just mention, in the recovery of the financial crisis, there were lots of stories why the economists didn't think Americans wanted to work. They said that once you're out of the labor force for six months, you're gone for good. They said that once somebody's on disability, they're never going to go off disability. Some economists said, you know, video games are getting so good that young men are not going to work. They're just addicted to their PlayStation. I mean, it's silly when I say it, but they actually made that argument or that people are gonna retire just because that's what the trend line has been. All of those stories have been wrong. They've all been wrong. As the economy got stronger, as wages started to climb, Americans said, hey, I wanna work. And a lot of people, you know, they, they do these surveys every month, the government does to ask people, are you working, whatnot. A lot of people answer those surveys and say, I'm not working and I'm not even looking for a job. And the next month they take a job. It's the darndest thing. And so I am firmly in the belief that the vast majority of Americans want to work. They want a decent job. They want a decent wage, but they want to work. And we need to help create the conditions so that they can do that. We will all be better off the more Americans we put back to work. Yeah, couldn't agree more. You know, you mentioned the supply chain constraints, and there's certainly a few key sectors, I guess, like manufacturing, automotive, housing, that are, are, have especially felt those. So um, the housing sector is always of particular concern to banks and to the customers that we serve. And we're now finding, interestingly enough, that in some markets, the median price of a newly built home is actually lower than the price of an existing home, which seems to be a little bit of a, a notable sign of a, a potential housing frenzy. So just given your previous experience, are you concerned about any kind of potential housing bubble? You know, we look at this very closely. We have a team at the Federal Reserve. I mean, all the banks look at it, but especially at the Board of Governors is the team of economists dedicated to financial stability. So we're always looking at this. Most American households are in a very strong financial position. 
You know, Congress has been very generous in providing family support to get through the pandemic. Uh, and so if you look at the balance sheet of American families, generally speaking, their balance sheets are quite strong. So we're not seeing signs of them over levering themselves to go reach in this some very frothy housing market. Of course, it must be happening on the individual level, but on the aggregates, we're not seeing the conditions that we saw in 2005, 2006, and 2007 before the, um, before the housing burst, the housing bubble burst. So that gives me some more confidence. And we also think that banks are more highly capitalized than they were before the 2008 financial crisis as well. So we think family balance sheets are stronger and bank balance sheets are stronger. That gives us more confidence that there, if there is an adjustment, they should be able to endure, uh, endure it on average. But, you know, we, we always keep our eyes open for signs of frothiness. I mean, that anecdote that I, don't, I just don't understand why, I can't understand why that would be true. Like if you had the chance to buy a new house or an existing house, why wouldn't you pay the same amount for the new house? I just, I can't reconcile how that intuitively makes sense. But I mean, the data is what it is. Yeah, yeah. One more question on the economy before we move on to maybe some monetary policy um, uh, exploration here. But, I, you know, I, I've learned so much from being on the Fed board that the Fed has access to and monitors and studies so many different economic points and indicators. And um, Alan Greenspan was rather famously known for some of the, the statistics he used to keep his ear to the ground. One, one uh, for instance, being the dry cleaning sales, because he thought, people who sent their clothes to the dry cleaning were doing something luxurious. And, and so if you're feeling good about the economy, you send your clothes to a dry cleaner. And so he took those stats very pretty seriously. I'm, I'm just wondering if there are any data points or indicators that you personally, whether they're traditional or non-traditional, uh, that you follow most closely to understand how our economy is doing. You know, it goes back to the labor market. Um, one time, you know, when I first joined the Federal Reserve, uh, dear friend of mine who recently passed, uh, Professor Eddie Lazier from Stanford, basically talked my ear off and said, the Federal Reserve is misreading the labor market. You guys think you're at maximum employment, you're not. And stop looking at the unemployment rate. Instead of the unemployment rate, look at the percentage of people who are working. Look at the percentage of working age people, say 25 to 55 that are working. That that, you know, remember I talked earlier about some people say, I'm not looking for a job, I'm not in the labor market, and yet they take a job. Turns out that judgment about whether or not somebody knows they're in the labor market is flawed. And a cleaner way of looking at it is the employment to population ratio, because you're not asking anybody's opinion. You either have a job or you don't. That's one measure that I look at very carefully is what is the overall percentage of adults who are working? Where has it been historically? Why do we think it should be lower now than it was historically? So that is a, I mean, the labor market is a complicated sector. We look at a lot of different measures. But that is one that doesn't get as much attention as some others that I think is enormously important to assess. Are we really at full potential as an economy? Yeah. So let's let's move on to monetary policy. And I know this is such a fluid situation uh, given the Delta variant and, and just how the how it's changing the, the return to uh, so many what we what we were hopeful is to, turns to be a normal environment again. But Given you know, given the strength of the economy, when I was looking at uh, data, not to, you know, just in the past few days, the consensus was expecting the economy to grow at a real annual rate of ten percent this quarter. So again, I'd like to uh, dig into a little bit more your view of inflation, especially when you think about if there, you know, what does it take to say there are mounting inflationary pressures? What would it take for the Fed to commence any tightening? Well, we would look at, we do look at a lot, just like the labor market, we look at a lot of different measures to get a sense of inflation. And one of them is, our, our goal is what we call headline PCE, personal consumptions expenditure, it's a basket of goods. And then we often will focus on core PCE because headline PCE includes energy and food, which tend to be volatile. And core PCE gives us a better signal of where long-term inflation is going. But even now, core PCE is having outside moves really being driven by the auto sector and some of these travel. I think 60% of the, of the increase in inflation comes from travel-related sectors and auto sectors. Then there are other measures. You know, The Dallas Federal Reserve puts out something called the trim mean, where they throw away the few highest and the few lowest readings and say, let's just get a sense of what's happening in the middle of the distribution. That's not showing very much movement at all. Another example, 
you know, the economy went through a rapid shutdown last year and now a rapid reopening. If prices of a good falls and then the next year it goes back to where it was, that second year, it's going to show extraordinary inflation, even though it's going right back to normal. So another thing we look at is let's look at a two-year average inflation measure to average out the valley. If you do that, we're running at about 2.3% inflation. And our goal, long-term goal is 2% inflation. And then finally, one other thing that I'll just point out, financial markets, you know, the treasury market, if you compare the nominal treasury bond market with the TIPS market, which is an inflation adjusted treasury market, you can get out of that. If you subtract the two, you can extract what do investors think is going to happen to long-term inflation? Well, inflation expectations embedded in treasury securities rose, but now they started falling again and they're not at concerning levels. So uh, it's a complicated picture, but most of the evidence that I see suggests that the high inflation readings are concentrated in sectors we would expect that are tightly tied to the reopening and are not yet bleeding over into broader, uh, broader sectors or into inflation expectations. So let's talk about the Fed's balance sheet a little bit. That you know, the Fed's minutes reflect that balance sheet guidance has been discussed in depth, and then there's in leaving room to extend bond buying further if the committee goals remain out of reach. So today you're speaking with CEOs of mid-sized banks with, you know, revenue generation seventy percent spread dependent. So we're all pretty focused on the Fed's deliberations on balance sheet guidance. Any perspectives you might offer mid-sized banks managing their balance sheet sensitivities over the next maybe three to five years? Well, I'll just go back to, you know, we first started our big quantitative easing program last year to try to address frictions and problems in the treasury market. The treasury market, believe it or not, was binding up because in the depth of the pandemic, People just wanted cash. They were so afraid because this pandemic, none of us had lived through a pandemic before. They just said, I want cash. So the treasury market started to seize up. So in our lender of last resort mode, we stepped in very aggressively to support functioning of financial markets. And those tools were effective. We then continued the program because quantitative easing, once we're at the effective lower bound on the federal funds rate, quantitative easing is a way to drive long-term interest rates down to try to provide more economic stimulus. And we've been continuing that. In December of last year, December of 2020, we announced that we would continue our uh, quantitative easing program, buying $120 billion of assets a month, until we made substantial further progress towards our dual mandate goals. So inflation, we're back to our goals, we've talked about, but we were, we're still seven to nine million jobs short of our maximum employment goal. So the question is, have we made substantial further progress? In my judgment, no. I think we're about a third of the way out of the hole that we were in last December. And I think many of my colleagues have said, and I have said, if we see a very strong labor market this fall, the way I've been expecting, then I think we could say, yeah, we probably have made substantial further progress. But the wrinkle now is Delta. If Delta causes the labor market to heal much more slowly, then that at least is gonna cause me to step back and say, hey, have we really achieved substantial further progress? And would this, uh, additional stimulus be necessary and beneficial to rebuild the labor market more quickly. Last thing I'll just say is, you know, we demonstrated after the quantitative easing associated with the financial crisis that once we got back to something more like normal, you know, we would stop buying and then eventually we would allow the portfolio to roll off in an orderly manner. I'm confident we can do that again. And my expectation is we will do that again once we get to get closer to our, our goals that Congress has assigned to us. And so I don't think quantitative easing is here forever. It's a tool we use when the times require it. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Let's move on to just a couple of questions here on regulatory matters and some public policy issues that are facing banks. So from a, from a regulatory perspective, the pandemic I think has definitely exposed serious deficiencies and I would say national, state, and local programs to provide equal opportunity for all as racial minorities and low-income families have been hardest hit, as you well know. So there's, there's been some political discussion of more specifically articulating the Fed's mandate for full employment to address root causes of un unemployment and underemployment and the, you know, the need for reskilling and more. So how is 
How is the Fed responding to its increasing its responsibility for resolving issues of inequity and economic opportunity? Well, I'm glad you asked that. You know, in 2017 at the Minneapolis Fed, we launched a research center just on this, the uh, Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute. We know that monetary policy, because it's one dollar, one currency for the whole country, we can't target certain regions, certain sectors, or certain groups with monetary policy. It's just a, it's the bluntest instrument that there is. But we have extraordinary research capability. So if we can do research onto structural issues that are keeping people out of the economy and illuminate those issues, we can arm local leaders, state and federal elected leaders with the best data and analysis possible so that they can make the most informed policy decisions that they possibly can. And that shows up a lot of different ways. In Minnesota, as you know, Gene, um, we're doing a lot of work with former Minnesota Supreme Court Justice Alan Page to advocate for a, a civil right for a quality, edu quality public education for all children in Minnesota, because Minnesota has some of the worst economic and racial disparities in the country in education. And if you, don't, if you come out of the gate and you don't get a good education, you have no hope of catching up later in life. I mean, education is that foundational. That's one example. Another example is uh, the Minneapolis Fed was selected by both the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul to do a long-term economic impact analysis. Both cities have voted to raise their minimum wage to $15 an hour. They asked us to do the analysis of what, what does that mean? What, is, what happens? Does it, is it good for workers or do they lose their jobs? Is it good for business? What does it mean for the economy? And they selected us, they said, because they said, you're the only research institution in the region that everybody will trust to do the analysis honestly and fairly. And that's our commitment. So that's another example. And then third, all 12 Federal Reserve Banks have partnered uh, on what we're calling the Racism and the Economy Series, where we are doing a deep dive, bringing in experts to look at housing, education, healthcare, criminal justice reform, criminal justice, to understand to what degree is fundamental racism woven into the structures of these sectors that are leading to disparate outcomes and what can we at the Fed do about it or what can other policymakers do about it? And I'm proud that all 12 Federal Reserve Banks have joined in partnership on this work. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I've personally been really impressed with the work that the uh, Minneapolis Fed has done um, to create that series and, and get all 12 banks involved. Why was it important to you personally as the bank's president to, to make that happen, Neil? You know, it, it happened, um, the inspiration for it happened after, unfortunately, George Floyd was murdered here in our backyard. You know, I live here. I'm a Minnesota resident. Our 1,100 employees, are, most of them are here. And this was a very personal thing that happened, obviously, to Mr. Floyd and his family, but to our community. And it affected a lot of our employees very personally. And so when that happened, uh, I spoke out on Twitter and just gave my reaction to it. And I was pretty direct in my assessment of what I saw. And then I called my colleague, who's going to be speaking at your future conference, Rafael Bostic, who's the president of the Atlanta Fed. You know, Atlanta is also an epicenter for these issues, every bit as much as Minneapolis is. And I asked him, what could we do together that would be bigger than just one reserve bank alone? That led to us brainstorming about this series. And then we, the, the Boston Fed said they want to be part of it. And before we knew it, all 12 other reserve banks said, yes, they want to be active partners in this work. And that was very gratifying to see everybody come together and realize we all have a shared responsibility to do our part. Terrific. So let me just ask about another significant, uh, more, more related to regulatory issue that uh, revolves around how to best capture the benefits of fintechs within the financial system today. And that's all about maintaining a levy, level playing field uh, with bank charters, which are highly regulated. So I, I'd really be interested in knowing how the Fed's view is evolving on national and state regulators providing special purpose, purpose charters and the potential uh, impact of tilting the playing field against uh, existing charters. Yeah, well, I, I certainly believe we need a level playing field and I'm not at all excited, both in terms of fairness, but also in terms of financial stability and consumer protection. I'm not excited about something that looks like a bank and acts like a bank but they don't call themselves a bank and therefore they get a pass on all of these rules. I mean, why were the rules developed? They were developed ultimately to protect consumers and to protect the economony. And so, uh, you know, I do one example of this, an egregious example of this is the cryptocurrency space, which is just the wild west of fraud, hype, 
and mostly nonsense from what I can tell. And there are people who are getting fleeced by billions and billions and billions of dollars. And I saw the SEC chairman yesterday or the day before made comments saying that the SEC is taking a hard look at the space, but they need more tools, more regulatory powers to make sure that they can get their arms around this. So I think it's an enormously important issue. Fairness, yes. I, I get why banks will care. They want a level playing field. I'm all in favor of that but also basic consumer protection and financial stability issues, not to mention making sure that there's not money laundering taking place, that you know, bad governments aren't getting funded, drug dealers aren't getting funded. I mean, there's a, there's a lot that goes here. You know, banks play a vital, very important role. And you may say, well, a lot of our burdens are, you know, maybe they're annoying, but they're there for a reason. And it's to try to prevent some of these very egregious problems from taking place. And we need to apply that broadly. So you may have seen that some senators have expressed concern about the central bank's foray into climate change. Can you comment at all on how the Fed might move forward on the climate change issue? And this has all to do with the uh, ESG and, and just really the headlines that's getting these days. Well, I, I think we have, I think understanding the risk of banks who we regulate, the risk of their portfolios, that's our day job. That's not a new thing. I mean, if, if your bank is highly concentrated in the ag sector, and let's say your bank is highly concentrated in corn, we're gonna say, hey, you know what? If you're that concentrated just in this one sector or just in this one crop, you're taking a lot of risk and you, we need to make sure that you understand the risk that you're taking. And so there are some financial institutions that have a lot of exposure to the Pacific Northwest that is vulnerable to forest fires. There are some banks that have a lot of exposure to the Gulf Coast that is highly vulnerable to hurricanes. So just making sure that banks are understanding the climate risk embedded in their credit portfolios, that's bread and butter of what regulators should be doing. Does it relate to monetary policy? You know, it's unclear to me that there's a role for monetary policy. You know, I think the climate is changing over the course, hopefully quite gradually. Monetary policy, we look at a three to five year horizon. I don't really see the connection between monetary policy and climate change, but in terms of bank supervision, uh, and understanding risks that banks are taking. I just think that we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we ignored the fact that there are these exposures. Well, Neil, I knew we would run out of time. We've reached a limit here, but it was such a pleasure to hear from you today. And I know you've answered a lot of questions on people's minds and you've given us more to think about as well. So again, really appreciate you joining us and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Jean. I really enjoyed the conversation.